we have another young Indian with us as part of the Voice of the Young series. Hello, everyone, those who are watching and listening. Today we have with us Rahul Sina. Let's hear from him. Over to you, Rahul. Hello. So, uh, it really fills my heart with joy unspeakable to be a part of this illustrious initiative curated by Dr. Mathur. Namaskar, uh, I'm Rahul Sinha, and I'm currently pursuing my master's in economics from Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, Kolkata. So it's been a month. I've been back from Bombay after completing my internship tenure at National Stock Exchange. And uh, I, would uh, I would really like to utilize the most of this evening by sharing certain things about my journey, my plans, and my academic perspectives. A bit about myself, uh, this is my second year at IIFT and the third semester at my institute has just begun. We have some wonderful electives this season and it finally gives me the essence of being a part of an institute that promises to specialize in trade and finance. And uh, I really had a blast over here for the past one year and I'm sure that the curriculum and other course of events will keep me as excited throughout this year as well. Okay, good to hear that it's meeting your needs. All right, let's continue. Yeah, so <clears throat> if I were to talk a bit more about my internship, so for my summer program, I went to National Stock Exchange. I worked under the supervision of Dr. Tirthankar Patnaik, who is the chief economist at NSE and heads the Department of Economic Policy and Research. So I had a wonderful experience over there. I got to meet some of the finest academicians from far off nations, CEOs, government representatives, and, and most importantly, I got involved in wonderful conversations with them. And uh, I worked on multiple projects, was on MSMEs of India, where I had to assess cash conversion cycles that they go through, the impact of financial intermediation, the need for ease of channelizing of funds, etc., and I also authored another paper where I talked about the education employment paradox. So the basic finding was the more and more we get educated, it becomes a problem in India. So the amount of unemployment is uh, hits the highest at the level of educated people who are graduates. So that was a problem that I found out. And so it was a policy paper and it is yet to be published. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Finally, a core finance project where I curated some codes for analyzing tick-by-tick -tick data pertaining to the cash markets. And uh, prior to this, I also had worked under the supervision of Dr. Anna Roy at Niti Aayog, where I contributed on two projects of national importance. One was on central bank digital currencies, which was in collaboration with Reserve Bank. And the other one was on uh, EdTech, which was in collaboration with MHRD. That, uh, so this was... So the Niti Aayog internship was during my undergraduation and uh, I'd be honest, uh, it really helped me to make up my mind for proceeding with further research and also helped me to build a knack in public policy studies. Okay. Hmm. So, so among a lot of things, one interesting thing that I realized at NSE was the importance of empirical research. So often lightheartedly, our chief economist would say that at economic policy and research division, we also do economics. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that that explained how how important data analysis and empirical exercises were to the team. So yeah. it really helped to learn a lot. Okay. Apart from this, what I personally like is uh, so most of my work is in the domain of applied microeconomics, where I have uh, used methods like general equilibrium analysis, uh, numerical simulations, and dynamic game theoretic models to portray and solve some real life socio political issues. And uh, currently, I'm working on some independent research projects. We can talk more about that if time, if we have time. And uh, I also would be willing to pursue my doctoral studies after the completion of my master's, for which I'm planning to take the GRE exams in the coming month. And so now, if I were to talk a bit more about my development of interest in political economics. Well, what so about your undergraduate days? The, the, those fun days, you haven't mentioned, you're talking too serious. What about the fun okay. days of undergraduate life? So, so I did my undergraduation from St. Xavier's University, which is again in Kolkata. But uh, COVID had struck at that time. Uh, I was in my second year. I the most, most of my college days were interaction with professor through this 13-inch screen. Yeah. And, but, but it helped me 
it helped me to utilize the most of my time in analyzing a lot of things were, that were going on that were going on around me things that were prevalent across the world things that were of importance to the society so that was the time where actually i could like analyze what i like what i want from my course and things that i want to dedicate my time to i i wrote papers uh, so so in india we have these wonderful colleges uh, located in delhi which uh, organize these paper presentation competitions for undergrad students so i i often used to participate in them i got involved in discussion with eminent professors mm -hmm. across the country i used to get a lot of response on the work that i am doing they used to tell me if i am going in the right way or the wrong way so that is how it worked out during my undergrads and the fun days were those when i used uh, when i got to interact with people like minded people when i went to these competitions the debate competitions the quizzes when i found out there are a lot of people like me so we also got to build up this community of like minded individuals and we are in touch that is really great to me okay that was really fascinating yeah you know you are it's amazing i had never anticipated this people used to say you know the lockdown of the covid is a disaster how will the people be they'll all be worse off and what i hear again and again from young people in india educated young people like you is that actually we use the time very well exactly so, we, so there we, we built connections we learned yeah. things we did things so i'm really happy to see this it's really remarkable uh, that you took advantage you are not the only one but uh, you are among the group yeah. <clears throat> it's amazing so uh, congratulations and uh, let us say well done <laughs> you know instead of saying oh my god i'm stuck in a hole there's nothing to do i you know how long can i watch youtube <laughs> for entertainment or how I can't even do insta you you took advantage right most of the credit also goes to my parents so three of us were sitting around in one room and we used to share things that we came across so even they got involved in hardcore academics after i was taking interest in this okay. so my father used to, father used to sit with me and suggest what changes i should make to the presentation how is it looking <laughs> the equation where it should be placed so it was really interesting family was bonding <laughs> exactly it was a fun time that i had <laughs> wonderful okay i'm so glad to hear it all right let's continue yeah so uh, a bit more about my development of interest in political economics yeah so this was uh, completely due to my parents so my mom and her fascination about mahabharat instilled the knack of studying and cherishing the concepts of, uh, of socio political theories in me so concepts like raj dharma concepts like distributive justice consultative governance and social hierarchies were some issues that my mom very well explained to me through stories and and these were the day, days when i used to come back from school and i used to hear to these stories and i really got a hint of what's happening around me so not just hearing terms from the media but hearing terms that already exist in our text and relating to them so this is also when i understood the importance of history how important it is and how relevant it is in our days as well and then uh, my father being a businessman from the field of textiles uh, i had a dual perspective towards it one which helped me to look at the tip of the pyramid so a trade in textiles have been a major source of revenue for our nation and the sector has gone through a lot of reforms so yeah. as my father has to export some of his products across nations we often had these dining table conversations about duties and tariffs that affect our business and the other side of the coin was visible to me when i went to towns like phulia and bolpur with my father and interacted with tatis who were these local handloom weavers to understand how fiscal policies and social schemes were of help to them so the towns which i mentioned are uh, towns that i that are located in west bengal and they are really famous for handlooms for sarees for textiles and me being a textile aficionado this this was also another great place where i spent most of my time and got to learn a lot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then i also had taken the initiative to delve deeper into the subject and discover more issues and uh, the macro 101 course at my institute at iift uh, 
uh, helped me a lot so it had a component which talked about schools of economic thoughts and that's where uh, this part was reignited and i so we got books from the library we used to study everything that happened earlier and things that are being challenged right now and link the dots so that was again helpful so we all must know one of the most earliest concepts uh, in political economics is mercantilism mm -hmm. which was prevalent in the 16th and uh, between 16th to the 18th century which emphasized national wealth through trade surplus and accumulation of precious metals so this is where it all began and this is also the foundation laying stone for uh, international trade economics as well mm -hmm. and so this is the time when we started talking about last fair how economic how economists can work on their own and then another key concept that was developed by adam smith was the wealth of nations in 1776 which mm -hmm. had laid the foundation for classical economics and smith argued that individuals pursuing self interest in a free market would lead to the overall benefit of the society mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. the invisible hand mechanism so mm -hmm. that's when we came across terms like uh, homo economicus the economics mm -hmm. man and mm -hmm. the benevolent and rational consumer mm -hmm. which which are later being challenged right now mm -hmm. and then again uh, if we fast forward to the 20th century john maynard keynes and his general uh, general theory of employment interest money mm -hmm. 1936 introduced keynesian economics and this is when formally and officially government intervention to manage economic cycles and maintain mm -hmm. full employment were being mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. so we are slowly shifting from mercantilism last fair setup to a setup which is uh, governed which is governed by a political party a system and uh, recently behavioral economics has, has gained a lot of prominence mm -hmm. so uh, challenging traditional rationality assumptions uh, nobel laureate richard thaler and his work nudge from 2008 highlights how small changes in the choice uh, architecture can influence behavior positively so Uh, a small note that i would like to bring up uh, right now is uh, i had the opportunity of presenting a paper at the cmc conference it was the conference for uh, computational and mathematical economics uh, which was organized by iit jodhpur and a uh, few students from different states of india were called and we presented papers so there was uh, a section for professors they presented papers uh, and uh, i had the opportunity of listening to what dr saptarshi mukherjee from iit delhi had to say yeah so uh, yeah his work is from the domain of eliciting preferences that's a uh, theoretical microeconomics so if i were to explain it with an example is uh, so we have a flight to catch and there's a w h smith bookshop yeah. and we enter enter the bookshop and there are 10 books arranged in a rack and we start from left to right we pick up the book and we we judge it by its cover <laughs> and the first book that we see we don't like the cover we keep it back to the shelf and the and slowly we proceed the fourth book is really interesting the cover is fascinating and we pick it up and for short term purposes our utility is satisfied okay but what we miss here is maybe the seventh or the eighth book would have contributed more to our intellect yeah. if we don't get to know that yeah so th this was a theoretical concept explained by him and later um, so at the gala dinner we had the opportunity of conversing and so we discussed how this is also essential in today's media which acts during the electoral politics uh, phenomena so okay. for example uh, i watch a, i watch a news channel a with my parents which talks about political parties x y and z yeah. and and bias towards political party z so it starts by uh, mentioning the agendas of political party z uh, i along with my parents listen to that and we are fascinated we think that political party z is really going to work well and we make up our mind that we'll vote for political party z when the elections come up and we switch off the tv we don't even listen to what political party x or y has to offer to us this yeah. is general behavior yeah. and this is beautifully explained by eliciting preferences so yeah. this is again when i understood that behavioral economics is not just for advertisement not just for business management but also plays an integral role in the occurrence yeah. of important important events across yeah. the nation which uh, shapes the society so okay. all this was really fascinating okay rahul and before you continue mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. you started with mercantilism and all and you fast forwarded i want to back fast back you to kautilya arthashastra take take it take some time to if not read the whole thing to read 
some aspects of it. There are plenty of journal articles. Uh, one of my friends who is also a serious economist has written a couple of books and it's fascinating. So, you know, we can rightly say that Cotillia thought of many things uh, that Western economists thought later. And the political economy, it is meant <clears throat> to guide the emperor. So it is political economy. And you will find in it several things uh, that uh, uh, pertain, for example, to foreign trade. <laughs> so, you know, he says you should have, you should encourage foreign trade because you can put import duties. <laughs> <laughs> and you can give choice to consumers. So you uh, give choice to the consumers and it's a nice way to collect taxes. So don't tax income, tax consumption when this is imported consumption. So people will pay. So anyway, I just want to tell you before I forget that take a chance and read, uh, if not the whole book, uh, at least some commentaries and discussions about uh, since you know your mother taught you Mahabharat and you are fascinated by history, this is history of economic thought, and it's worth uh, reading. And I did report, you know, uh, in my core economics book, <clears throat> in chapter two, I have uh, great thinkers in economics, and it starts with Cotillia. So it's worth mentioning to you since you are so interested in all these things, and just see the political economy of how the emperor should manage the budget and the people's expectation. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but I needed to get it in. Thank you so much. So, okay, uh, and, uh, so in the recent years also, uh, yeah, inequality and climate change have been uh, very crucial topics of discussion in political economics. Thomas Piketty's Capital examines the dynamic of wealth concentration, while economists like William Nodos uh, focus on environmental economics, providing policy insights for sustainable development. And lastly, what so the most fascinating thing to me was the rise of digital currencies and blockchain technologies, which had sparked discussions on the future monetary future of monetary systems, with research papers uh, such as uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin. Uh, from 2008 being for foundational to understanding the potential impl implications of decentralized digital currencies. So this is again a domain where I'm working right now. I'm uh, with another economist from London School uh, named uh, Tim Doberman. I am working, I, I was discussing something on similar lines. So we were trying to develop a, a optimal green taxation policy that wouldn't leave any incentive for either the uh, cryptocurrency miner or the government to get into crony capitalistic terms. So, so there is this complete literature that exists about the amount of carbon footprint generated by the cryptocurrency miner why, like during it performs mining exercises with its supercomputers and how a government can restrict it. Otherwise, all this sustain all these sustainable development goals that we have in mind will never be fulfilled. So we are uh, we are continuously moving towards creative destruction over here. So this is something that governments should also look into. And uh, so that's that. And so if I were to conclude about these and uh, this entire political economics thing and uh, public policy in general. So I need to mention that in the context of developing countries, the intersection of political economics and public policy becomes paramount okay. due to the unique challenges and opportunities in place. So these countries grapple with a multitude of issues ranging from poverty and inequality to infrastructure gap, limited access to education, healthcare, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. lack of efficient governance structures. Mm -hmm. So effective public policies grounded in political economics can address these challenges comprehensively. One, one crucial aspect uh, is inclusive economic growth that, uh, that Dr. Sen and Dr. Trez have been talking about for a lot of years right now. And uh, policies that promote a conducive business environment, reduce bureaucratic hurdles, and prioritize job creation can uplift millions from poverty. Okay. Distributive justice is equally vital. Public policies should ensure that benefits of economic growth reach marginalized communities, thereby narrowing the income gap and reducing social unrest. Sustainable development is another key concern. Uh, so moreover, improving public services is really essential. 
access to quality education, healthcare, enable citizens to break free from the cycle of poverty, uh, while robust infrastructure enhances overall productivity. This is yeah. also what I would like to say for the case of upcoming uh, artificial intelligence in the field of economics as well, how it would impact. So in the short run, we can think that it will eat up a lot of jobs, etc. But as time proceeds, it will only help us to become more productive. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so a little plug in, uh, uh, we work at the uh, IIFT Economic Society in my college and we have just launched this magazine of ours which talks about the impact of AI, the positive and the negative impacts. And we were able to get in, uh, get into conversations with eminent economists like Dr. Ajay Agarwal, Dr. Avi Goldfarb from uh, University of Toronto, who who uh, also happened to be the author of the book Predictive Machines. So it's, yeah. it's a quite famous book in the field of AI. And even they mentioned that, so it's all positive, nothing's negative in this. So in the initial years, it will be a problem. This has happened from the existence of mankind for the first yeah. time, when a porter used to take a good work, a good of 10 kilos on his back from point A to point B, he used to earn pennies. But when the stone wheel was invented, so so they thought that uh, his income would go, his, his, he would not be able to get involved in the things that he's doing right now. He would lose his source of livelihood. But later, it only happened to be the case that that person got uh, himself equipped with uh, resources, uh, himself equipped with practice, and then he became the driver of this vehicle. Okay. So it will take time, but it will generally uh, help help us to proceed in life. Okay. And again, a problem that exists in a developing country that we have to mention is corruption. So it is a pervasive issue in many developing nations, hampering progress. So public policy should also focus on transparency, accountability, and anti-corruption measures to blind, uh, to build trust and promote efficient resource allocation. So overall, the synergy between political economics and public policy in developing countries can create a pathway towards inclusive, sustainable, prosperous um, societies. By addressing these multifaceted challenges with uh, well-informed policies, what we can, uh, what these nations can do is unblock their truest potential and empower their citizens to shape a brighter future. Okay. So, in in conclusion, as I stand here at this juncture of my academic journey, I'm reminded of the words of John Maynard Keynes, uh, who once mentioned that the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than than is commonly understood. Yeah. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Yeah. <laughs> well so, done. Uh, okay. Uh, so we have embarked on on a path that not only empowers us with the knowledge but also equips us to shape the future of nations. So to all my uh, fellow peers and people from the academic circle, let's continue to be the torchbearers of change, the champions of equitable growth, and the seekers of wisdom in this intricate world of political economics. Here's well, to embracing complex cities, uh, celebrating triumphs, and above all, to the exhilarating journey that lies ahead. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Do you have any tips for your juniors? Yeah. So, so uh, a wonderful line that I came across uh, during while while watching a web series, The Rocket Boys, was uh, like good minds often tend to lose objectivity in their pursuit of achieving excellence. This is what uh, Dr. Homi Bhava had to say to Vikram Saravai. Uh. So this is something that we should keep in mind. So the life is not revolving around this four-walled classroom. We should need, we must need to get out. We must need to see what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. So the problem in India is people are getting educated, but people have very less amount of knowledge about what's happening in the markets, what what's actually happening in the businesses. The Acad the academic knowledge that that is being imparted in the classrooms is not always fulfilling the needs of the recruiters. So yeah. what we need are the people from academia. So what we need to understand is we should have a clear cut view of the current scenarios that are uh, prevalent in the society. We should have our own opinion. We should also start building in solutions in our mind how we can be of any help to the society. So we are studying, we are earning 
some lakh rupees and then settling for our own lives is not is not the solution so okay. if we talk about equitable society if we talk about altruism altruism then we need to understand how much our contribution is necessary as well so that's it it's it's not very light hearted it's it's really getting serious no, no, i, right I don't ask you for light hearted i'm saying that there are people who are say 4 5 years younger than you who are perhaps thinking along the same lines as you so what are they serious okay so what tips can you give them no. how to do it you are saying this is what you should do but do you have any tips on how you did it and how they can do it yeah. so, so what i did was i i started reading up journals reading up articles i followed eminent economists they have a lot of wonderful blogs on the blogs on the internet that we can follow uh just just get out on the streets and start conversing with people that's better than any other any degree that an institute can provide you okay so so so, uh, so one thing that i would like to say is keep your eyes open that's okay. it okay yes. keep your eyes open and yes and listen i would say yeah. keep your ears open listen don't keep talk all the time. don't talk yeah. all the time do listen right yeah you do listen okay anything else you want to add at this point Nothing. Okay, good. Maybe we okay. catch up with you one year from now to see what you are doing. In the meantime, let me say congratulations. Well done. Uh, you have certainly pursued your ideas very passionately and with determination, and you have presented them very well. And I thank you for it. It's indeed a pleasure to talk to young people like you and to see where you know you can take. India forward. Okay. So I'm happy. Okay. Shall we end it here now? We can do that. Thank okay. Fine. Well. Okay. So fine. Uh, bye bye, everybody. I'll be back soon with another young person or an expert. Until then, bye. Bye, everyone.